few different movies in this series at the movies and kind of talked about some ideas that we've seen in each one. And one thing that um, stuck out to me as I was watching that, I actually watched a whole bunch of trailers uh, this past week. And I really want to see Thor Ragnarok. Um, Anybody else Avengers fans? Yes, yes. I um, really like, um, like the Avengers. And Loki's back in this one, in the next one. But we're not talking about that. I did watch a lot of trailers this week. But one thing that sticks out to me in that trailer is Optimus Prime is apparently um, turned against humanity, right? Yeah. And so he is trying to find a way of redemption for the Autobots or something, and he meets the maker of them or whatever. I don't know. I just, what I know from here. And so um, one thing he says, though, is that for... My world to live, yours must die. And that struck out to me. It, it just it hit me. So um, write that down. For my world to live, yours must die. In that clip, um, Anthony Hopkins' character said that there are two worlds colliding and that without leaders, chaos reigns. And those are actually all biblical ideas that we see in the Bible. Um, Jesus... Uh, tells us, we're going to look at a passage here, that for his kingdom to live in us, our kingdom has to die. And so, um, and, and, and there are, the Bible talks about two worlds at work in our, in our lives. We have a, a spirit man that wants to please God. We have a flesh man, the Bible calls it, that wants to please ourselves. And so these are, th- are things we see. And Proverbs talk about the fact that when there is no leader that... Um, People kind of do what they think is best, and that usually ends in not good things happening. But I want to focus on that, that first one I had you write down. For my world to live, yours must die. And so tonight, if you have your Bible, who's got a Bible or even a Bible app that you have with you, I would encourage you to bring those and look at them with us. And if you bring it and show the youth staff, they'll give you a piece of candy out of the bucket. So bring a Bible, get a prize. Um, but we're going to look at Luke chapter 9. We're going to look at just four verses tonight. And the section is titled, The Cost of Discipleship. Do you guys know there's a cost to following Jesus? Yeah, yeah. There, there's a cost. And so we're going to talk about that. Write down this big idea, and this is really the, the main point, is that we have to deny, deny yourself. One is deny yourself, D-E-N-Y yourself. Look at your person next to you and say, deny yourself. <laughs> and give me some candy. Deny yourself and give me some gum. Oh, I don't know about that. But that is really the big idea tonight. So as we look at these uh, verses 23 and 24 of Luke chapter 9, it's on the screen. It's on your handout. Um, let me listen to this as I read it. And this is Jesus talking. He says, Then he said to them all, If anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself. Say, deny yourself. I didn't say deny himself, Luis. I said deny yourself. Nice try, though. You didn't, didn't, didn't get the point on correctly following. Verse 24, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So this is a difficult thing that Jesus is talking about. Um, there's a few times in the New Testament when Jesus was talking to a bunch of people, crowds followed him because Jesus did amazing stuff. How many of you would like to see Somebody that could never walk, stand up and walk. How many think that'd be pretty cool? How many of you think it would be really crazy if you were at a funeral and the guy that was dead got up and started walking around and talking to everybody? How many think that would be really crazy? How many of you think that that would be crazier than David Blaine's street magic to see dead people come back to life? Probably. David Blaine's street magic, the guy that weirds people out by doing tricks right in front of him? Harrison Ford, he did... He did a trick in front of Harrison Ford, and Harrison Ford's like, get out of my house, because you're freaky. Um, anyway, so people followed Jesus because he did amazing things. One time, all, there was thousands of people following Jesus, and he was up on a hillside, kind of like a natural amphitheater, and he was teaching them, and it got late, and they were hungry, and Jesus said to his disciples, hey, let's feed these people. And they're like, um, Jesus, uh, send them to the town. Let them go buy their own dinner because we don't have what it's going to take to feed these people. And he's like, well, what have you got? And he's like, well, let's, let's see what we got, guys. And so they find just a few loaves of bread and a few fish. And Jesus says, sit the people down. 
He prays over it and he says, break it up and start passing it out. And over 5,000 people were fed because Jesus prayed over the meal. How many of you are like, Jesus, I need you to come to my house and pray over my cupboards because I need a lot more food to eat, right? Well, Jesus knew this principle. If you amaze them and you feed them, they will come, right? If you guys, if I said we're having free pizza tomorrow, how many of you would show up? Right. So Jesus knew this principle about people. If I feed them and I amaze them, they will come. But here's the thing. When he had the crowds following him, there were a couple times that he gave some really hard to take teaching. And it was at that point that it, it narrowed the people out. It was like the people that were really wanting to follow Jesus and those that were in it just to get the free stuff, right? Well, Jesus, this was one of those teachings. He says, If anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it, will save it. One translation says find it. So here's the thing. The people in Jesus' time didn't know the cross as a piece of jewelry. How many of you own a cross that is a necklace or a bracelet or a ring or something nice? It's it's fancy. That was not the cross in any way to this group of people that Jesus was talking to. The only association that they had to the cross was death because the Persians uh, thousands of years ago started putting people on crosses to kill them for crimes and punishment, for capital punishment. Um, They would put them on crosses, but the Romans perfected this way of, of killing people for their crimes. And so when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, he's really saying, be willing to die in your pursuit of following me. Deny yourself so much that if if it comes to the point of you are gonna die and follow me or you are gonna live and deny me, that you will choose to die to follow me. That's pretty crazy, right? Jesus is saying, be willing to deny yourself. Whatever is not going to bring you closer to me, you're going to, in essence, put to death. So we, he's saying, have to forsake our own personal ambitions and our own personal desires so that we will fulfill God's will in our life. So there's consequences to that, right? Denying yourself to that level means that there are going to be natural consequences. You might face loss as a natural consequence. You might have a plan to to lay down your own desires and dreams and be obedient to Jesus' plan for your life. Now, when I was about a sophomore in high school, so how many of you are sophomores? Um, About that time in my life, up until that point, I wanted to be a scientist. I was amazed with sea life, and so I wanted to be a marine biologist. I had a plan that I was going to go to school somewhere up in the Pacific Northwest, like Washington or Oregon, and I was going to pursue marine biology because there I knew I could see a lot of really cool marine animals like whales and sharks and all sorts of really cool stuff. And so here's my idea. I'm going to be a marine biologist. I'm going to get to travel the world. I'm going to get to see really cool things and experience really cool experiences, and that's what I want for my life. And at about the the age of 15 or 16, um, I had a youth pastor that was encouraging me to read the Bible and pray and seek God and, and teaching me how to do that. And so I began to do that and I felt like God was telling me, I want you to be a pastor, right? And so that's a completely different path than what I wanted for myself. So I had to make a choice. Do I want to be obedient to what I feel like God is telling me to do or do I want to do what I think would be really cool and what I think would be best for my life, right? Right? Now, God's journey brought me a lot of really cool things, but I had to make that decision. And so that same decision as you, you might have plans and dreams and ideas and desires that you have to want to have, but God might have a different plan. And so being obedient and, and denying yourself might bring you loss. The other thing, it might bring you shame. That's another consequence of following Jesus because there are going to be people that think that you are completely stupid for believing in a Bible, believing in God, believing in Jesus, believing that he died for your sins, believing that anybody could rise from the dead. That's just foolishness. So how could you believe any of that? Because that's not what is happening. That's not reality in their minds. So they might shame you for your belief. The third thing that I just thought of, the consequence could actually be death. Do you know that in many nations around the world, what we're doing right now is considered illegal and a crime that is punishable by death? Us coming to a church 
and reading from the Bible and talking openly about Jesus in many countries is a crime whose punishment is imprisonment and death. It's crazy. The Bible that you might carry might be at home on a bookshelf is illegal to take into many countries in our world because they are so anti-God. Right now in China, it's illegal to be a Christian and to openly share your faith with other people. To tell somebody else about Jesus is a crime that could land you in prison. In fact, the Chinese government will go into these. They don't let churches really meet in like buildings like this. They have to meet in homes. They have house churches. But they will go in and arrest the pastors of those house churches and drag them off and throw them in prison and not let anybody have any communication with them. Not, nobody knows what's happening with them. But they say this is the cost. In Arab countries, it's illegal to be a Christian. And, and often young ladies that turn from... Islam to Christianity are shunned by their parents. And, and crazily enough, there are fathers that will kill their own daughters because they turn to faith in Christ. But they've said, this is the cost that I'm willing to pay. This is the price that I'm willing to pay in order to follow Christ. Sam? No, because it's and the Islam is, Islam is the government and the religion. And so according to Islam, that's acceptable. Nope. So here's the thing. Jesus says, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Fortunately, in America, we're not to that point yet. I can stand here and preach and I can record this message. I can put it on YouTube and there's not going to be people that are going to come to my house and drag me out of it and kill me because I'm saying what Jesus said. But in some parts of the world, that is the cost. When you try and hold on to what is yours and your rights and your ideas and your ideals and what you think is best for your life, Jesus says you're going to end up losing out. But when you say that, Jesus, I'm willing, whatever it costs, I'm going to follow you. He says that you will find life. And to see that reality, the second thing is this. The, it takes the right perspective. Write that down. Number two, the right perspective. In Luke 25 and, uh, nine, <clears throat> sorry, Luke 9, verses 25 and 26, Jesus went on to say, For what does it benefit a person if he gains the whole world, but loses, loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. So Jesus kind of puts out this this question. What benefit is there in having everything that the world has to offer you if you're lost spiritually? And you think of, you know, all the stuff that you could have. I, I um, follow a few different things on Instagram that kind of show, like, really nice cars. How many of you guys like, guys, you like nice cars? And I follow a few different furniture makers, and they make really nice furniture. How many of you guys, like, have nice things in your house? And sometimes I follow people because they just take p- really good pictures of food. How many of you just love food? And when it looks really good, like you see it on Instagram and then you're like, I got to go to get a snack out of the kitchen. So you go get some, some chips or something, right? And so I often see some really nice things that a lot of people have. And I don't have maybe the nicest of things sometimes. I've got a car that's broken down, so I can't drive it right now. So Mel and I have to share a, a vehicle. It is what it is. So I can look at the nice car, but I don't have the nice car. It is what it is, you know. But here's the thing. Jesus says, if you had all the right stuff, if you had the best phone and the best clothes and you had the best car and the best house in the best neighborhood, you went to the best school and you had invitations like to go to the best college or university that you would want to go to and you could pursue whatever you had and you had all the right money to make that happen. And like when you walk around, you had somebody, have you guys seen Guardians of the Galaxy 2 when the golden princess lady is like walking like this because her servants are carrying the rug in front of her and she's just walking like this because her feet don't touch the ground and that was your life like people just carry rugs in front of you so that your feet don't even have to touch the ground and everything is perfect sounds pretty good right but Jesus says if you have all that stuff but you've lost your spiritual self it's not worth it here's a reality that that many people don't understand or realize that 
people that are like ultra rich CEOs that are at the top of their business world that have all the stuff that they want, they are way more likely to suffer with depression. You guys know that? You guys know what, that studies have shown the happiest places in the world are also the poorest places in the world? Isn't that crazy to think about? Like our idea of what would be like making it is so flipped upside down that we think we have to have all the right stuff to be happy. But really, when we're happy with what we have and we're content with where we're at, then we're going to be happier. Jesus says, if you could gain the whole world and you've lost your soul, then you've lost everything, right? It makes us really ask the question, what really matters in? We have to get a a new perspective because Jesus is saying the things that are temporary that you think are the most important really are the least important. And the things that are eternal really are the most important and that's what you should focus on. So I, I was trying to think of a way for us to kind of get an idea of eternity. And so I got this rope. And um, who's back there? Hannah? Can you help me out and just take this rope and just, let's see how long it is. I don't even know how much rope I have here. I don't remember why I bought this rope. But okay, so let's pass it. Let's go back. Hannah's, you might have to, okay, we're going to keep going. Um, <laughs> Keep going. You just kind of, hey, uh, um, Lillian, right? Can you grab that rope and pass it down your aisle right there and kind of go over your head? And Hannah, can you give part of that rope to um, like, like uh, Rachel right there? Uh, she was sitting right behind you. And can you pass that back? And Hannah, can you take some of it and pull backwards and see how far, how much, are we at the end yet? Okay, so you guys see the rope, right? Hey, Marin, can you hold up that rope? Don't spill my coffee because that's coffee and espresso and it's <sighs> heavenly juice. Angel, can you take part of that rope and pull it your way? It's, it's heavenly. Okay, now I can get back in the light. So this rope I got to represent eternity. It's really, really big, right? It's hard to even see. I can hardly even see Hannah because I'm standing in the light. But see this gray tape I put on the end? This gray tape represents all of human history. So as long as we've been keeping track of history, remember the red rope is eternity. This is human history. Luke, can you tell me what's on the, the little part of that tape? No. My Angel, can you tell me what's on there? Uh, did you get a white dot? No, right there. Hey, Sam, can you tell these middle school boys what's really on there? A black line on there. Thank you, Sam. I, knew, I shouldn't have gone to middle school boys for a straight answer. So... This gray tape represents all of human history, and this black line represents our lives. Okay? So in view of eternity, look around the room, and you see the rope that's going all over the place, and it's so long, and we can hardly see the end of it. And this represents all of human history, and this little black line represents our lives. And in view of eternity, how much is really there? How, what's more important if, if we have eternity in view and we have our little bitty short existence, the Bible says that our lives are like vapors. They're like a mist. Erica, can you grab the end of that and just start wrapping it up for me? Okay. Our lives are like a mist or a vapor. You guys ever been out in the morning and you've seen the fog lying low on the ground? And then pretty soon... That fog is gone because the sun comes out and warms it up and it's gone. It's kind of like the smoke that you see rising from a candle that is just there for a moment. I'm tossing this back to you. Thank you very much. So in, in perspective, our life is so very minimal when we look at, at comparison to eternity. And so that's why Jesus says that our focus has to be directed at what's going to matter in eternity. If our focus is entirely on what we can get right here and right now, then we are missing the huge picture that he's trying to put out in front of us. Emily Post, you guys know what an etiquette expert is? 
an etiquette expert, is somebody that teaches you how you should act properly. They would tell you that when you sit down to dinner, the fork on the outside is the salad fork. And so when your salad is served, you eat salad with the salad fork. And then when they come and take your salad plate, you put that fork on there. And then the next fork in is going to be your dinner fork. And you work your way in from the outside in when you're sitting down. That's etiquette at the table. I know. And so Emily Post was an etiquette expert many, many, many years ago. And she was once asked a question by a reporter, and she said, what is the correct procedure when one is invited to the White House but has a previous engagement? And Emily Post replied, an invitation to dine at the White House is a command, and it automatically cancels any other engagement. Here we see that Jesus' invitation to us is to count the cost, to take up our cross, to lay down our rights, and to follow him. And that invitation cancels out any other invitation, any other commitment in our lives. You might say, but it costs too much. I can't do that. There's no way that I could commit to that level of commitment in following Christ. But to do it, I said you have to have the right perspective. And one author said this, I want you to, um, this is like your second to last fill in. It says, what is gained in Christ far outweighs all that is lost for Christ. So you have to realize there are going to be losses. There are, there's going to be shame. There's going to be maybe suffering and, and it could be death. That's an unfortunate reality that Jesus says, this is going to be a difficult thing for you, so many to, to take on. But what is gained in Christ far outweighs all that is lost for Christ. So what is gained beyond just eternal life? What do, we, what do we get? Well, when we choose to follow Jesus, we know that we have life. He says life to the full, life abundant. We know that we have hope beyond today. We know that we can have peace and we can have love. We can be full of joy and there is goodness that is in Jesus and there is his faithfulness that he's always with us and he promises never to leave us or forsake us and his presence is always there. Because what is gained in Christ far outweighs all that is lost for Christ. So the question tonight before we pray and dismiss is this. Will you answer the call to deny yourself, to get the right perspective, and to follow Jesus? If we go back to the original idea we started with, we would say this. For Jesus' kingdom to live, yours must die. Say, Jesus, you can be the Lord of my life and you can sit on the throne of my heart and I'm gonna follow you because I know that your kingdom far outweighs any kingdom that I could ever build for myself. Let's pray tonight. Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together, Lord God, and to look into your word, to have fun, to to lift up songs of worship and praise to you, Lord God. And I just pray over each and every student that is in this room, every leader, Lord God, I pray that you would help us to look inside ourselves, to to get the right perspective tonight, Lord God. And if there are areas of our lives that we haven't submitted to you, if there are are kingdoms that we're trying to build on our own that aren't what you want to do in our lives, Lord, I pray that we would lay down our rights to those things tonight and submit ourselves to your lordship. Lord, I pray that you would help us to commit ourselves fully to you.